This week we're talking books again. More insight from the Okinawan masters in this case, Shoshin Nagamine and his book, The Essence of Okinawan Karate Do. Hey, what's up? I'm Ken. This is Ken Fruit TV, and every week I release videos on the martial arts, training, philosophy, technique, that sort of thing. You're watching Ken Learns Ken Fruit, the series where I discuss uh, my reflections and things on stuff that I'm currently working through as my training continues. A lot of that sometimes comes from books in this case. Be sure to subscribe if you're new here. If you like videos like this, make sure to like this one. Share it with people you think that it could be useful to. Make sure to hit that bell if you do subscribe because while I do these videos every Monday, a lot of my other videos are not as consistent, so you'll want to be sure to catch those. So there's been a quote stuck in my head for a while now. Um, something I picked up a long time ago that it kind of continues to come about during training this week. It kind of kept coming back to me, and that quote has to do with karate and how it's meant to use all parts of the body. But that quote is by Shingo Ogami inside his book, Introduction to Karate. That quote was in my head, but when I went looking for it, I picked up this book because I was thinking that that's the book that that was in, which it, it's not. So when I went to my library to, to find that book for this video, uh, I picked up this one by Shoshin Nagamine, uh, because for whatever reason, I've always got these two books, not these two people, but these two books confused in my head. And as I was flipping through this book, trying to find that quote, I ran into something that I think I want to talk about today. Uh, but obviously it wasn't this book. So maybe next week, we'll talk about this one. So today, this book. Shoshin Nagamine. So Shoshin Nagamine was an Okinawan master in the Shorinru system. His instruction, his three teachers were Ankichi Arakaki, Chotoku Kian, and Choki Motobu. Motobu we talked about in a video recently. For all intents and purposes, a lot of this book is reference material. So he spent a lot of time putting in a lot of pictures and walkthroughs of the 18 kata that Shorinru styles practice and some basic discussion on stances and ukewaza and that kind of thing all in here. Towards the beginning, there's some bits of history and his reflections on the idea of training and what study should look like. That is what we're going to talk about today. So if you own this book, I'm on page 29, where he has a section called Recommendations for Study. Okay, so let's look at those recommendations. The following are important recommendations and mottos under which karate do should be learned and practiced. Number one, develop karate do on the basis of its history and tradition. Two, Study and practice kata strictly and correctly in order to focus all possible strength into each movement of the kata, constant repetition is required. The body must be thoroughly trained and this takes many years. Even after many years, kata practice is never finished, for there is always something new to be learned about executing a movement. Number three, study and practice kumite, formalized and free fighting, not primarily for tournament purposes, but to acquire mai to develop the martial arts sense of reading the opponent's movements and to develop ki and stamina, which cannot be fully attained through the practice of kata alone. Number four, fully utilize such methods as rope skipping, exercise with barbells, dumbbells, chishi, an ancient form of dumbbell, sashi, iron hand grip, etc., to develop the muscles and physical power. Number five, study the use of makiwara from every possible angle in order to develop a temi, concentrated destructive power. This force is manifested in such demonstrations as the breaking of boards, tiles, or bricks with the hands or feet. And number six, include Zazen, Zen training in a sitting position, in karate practice for further mind training and understanding of the essence of karate do and Zen as one. So let's look at these one by one. I really like kind of digging into these individual recommendations that, that different masters have put into their texts. And so let's start with the first one. Number one, develop karate on its basis of history and tradition. This one's interesting and creates a lot of, of rifts between different groups of people. History and tradition. So recently I posted a video on how you can improve your martial arts by passing things through a five-way filter, one of which was history. History is really important to look at from the aspects of understanding the context of training. You really have to know what was going on in that time period to have an understanding of what's happening. So when he mentions, hey, let's look at this from a historical standpoint, make sure you develop your karate from that. I don't personally take that as strictly adhere to the way we've done things and our history. I think he wants you to make sure that you recognize the pieces of history that fall into place to go with this. And because of that, you have a stronger understanding of how all this ties together and why things were done the way they were. So tradition is defined as, as the act of passing along information, right? So karate is both a, an oral and a physical tradition. It's passed along through physical study and talking about it. There are books now. 
there are books over a period of time, but but originally there weren't a lot of books and that wasn't a method that this was passed on by. So he's gonna speak a lot about kata because that was the way that we passed those physical skills on was to study and practice kata and then be able to deliver that kata to the next person and help them understand and then study and practice kata to continue that on. That is the tradition. The tradition in this case is the method by which we study. Obviously important in this book's case because he then goes on to show the 18 different kata so that they can be passed in that way. I think it's really important to remember the history of the different arts because it's gonna help you in just your general understanding. Anything in life, if you don't understand the history of it, then you only have a piece of it and you don't understand how it fits into the greater the greater whole. So make sure to include that in your practice. And if it's not included in your school, if that's not something that is included in your study, add it, at least to yourself. You can always go and do your own self-study, which I highly encourage. And heaven forbid you get a group of people together who want to know more about this stuff and, and study together or, or talk about this stuff. I think that's really cool. And you're starting to see a lot more things, podcasts and different stuff talking about these things. I've yet to find a, a mainstream martial art or even less mainstream martial arts that don't have some level of a historian karate a really good one patrick mccarthy you know the filipino martial arts you got mark wiley things like that where you've got at least one or many people who are putting into the effort of study and passing on the idea of the history of this stuff so look for those historians that are in the art that you practice all right so number two Study and practice kata strictly and correctly. In order to focus all possible strength into each movement of the kata, constant repetition is required. The body must be thoroughly trained, and this takes many years. Even after many years, kata practice is never finished, for there is always something new to be learned about executing a movement. Personally, I could never question the truth of this. Kata gives you a really unique and great opportunity to work through the individual motions of things. So in class, when I talk about kata and I talk about drills like that, Talk about the ability to, to internalize, to move your mind inside and focus on what's happening in your own body, how you're moving, what it feels like, how you're executing it. When you're doing that, especially in repetition, you get the ability to understand improvements and progress in places that are not so good. So you get to make a movement and decide how that felt and if it was on the right track or falling off track. And, and that continuous cycle of doing that puts you back into a place where you can continue to refine and refine and refine. And even just understanding your body, understanding your own balance, understanding your own ability, your own strengths, your ways of movement in lifting and pushing and pulling and all of these things, hugely important. When you work with a partner, you don't, you're, you're externally focused. Your thoughts are on what they're doing, making sure that you're able to move in time to not get hit or grabbed or whatever the thing that you're working on is, how to affect their body, their body weight, their position, their balance with yours, which is invaluable. And I truly, I think that was number, yeah, it's number three. So we'll come back to that. But because of that, because it's such an external thing, you have to make time for the internal thing to help you slow down and, and pay attention to the parts that you're responsible for, right? How do you become better at affecting somebody else's body position? Well, you better start by understanding your own body position so that you're able to move into those places and affect theirs strongly. There are many things, especially when it comes to throws and sweeps and different types of techniques that I refer to as symmetrical because the position that I put myself in to do them to you, you can do directly to me in the same case. So if I don't set myself properly, I've given you the same technique to do to me. Even if you don't know that technique, it's just something that can happen, right? Think of off balancing. If I step through and put myself off balance, you could instinctually take my balance because it's it's obvious. So it starts with your understanding of your own body and how to move your body. You've got to figure out how to move this machine before you can start figuring out how to move somebody else's machine, right? So spend time in that. And that's what kata does. It allows you to pass on a, a, an entire textbook of examples of the principles of fighting, but it also allows you to really focus internally on how your body operates. Your body operates. The person right next to you practicing the same kata is discovering different things about themselves and you have to allow for that and you have to allow the focus on your own body and how you do it, not the people around you. Kata, that's what it's for. Okay, number three. Study and practice kumite, formalized and free fighting, not primarily for tournament purposes, but to acquire mai, to develop the martial arts sense of reading the opponent's movements, and to develop the kiai and stamina, which cannot be fully attained through the practice of kata alone. So a lot to unpack there, multiple pieces to look at. For study and the practice kumite, do it. Make sure that you are doing kumite. Now kumite is the fighting, the sparring, the different methodologies of interacting with another person. 
this can be in two-person drills. This can be free form. And so you'll notice he's referring to formalized and free fighting. Formalized being two-person drills and ways to practice methodologies or maybe sparring with certain limitations to allow you to focus on particular things. And free fighting where it's live training and you don't know what's going to happen next as you work with this individual and you get the opportunity to execute the things that you know, try things, learn really, really important. Not every school has enough emphasis put on kumite. It's important. You got to make sure that you're doing it because at the end of the day, everything that you're doing, if you don't put it in context, and in this case, you have now both a historical context and a physical context. If you don't put it in that physical context, anything's possible. Theoretically, anything can happen. But until I try it, until I execute it, it's not, it's not real yet. It's just theory. Now, not primarily for tournament purposes. Why? Because karate was a self-defense art. It was for civilian self-protection. You know, it wasn't for soldiers on a battlefield. It was not for tournaments. It was for self-protection. So in this case, he's recognizing, and there's other spots in this book where he talks about the effects of tournaments and things like that, tournament study. So instead, he's referring to the benefits that you're going to get out of your karate practice in context of civilian self-protection. The first being my. My is the idea of distance and range. When you move and I move, where are we in relation to each other? And how does that movement work? If you move, what ways do I need to move in order to, to work with that? To keep myself safe or close distance and enter? Different things like that. All of that is in the concept of my. To develop the martial arts sense of reading the opponent's movements. Obviously very important. Look at any sport fighting art and you're going to see that idea of people that can react very quickly to different things that they're doing. Just recently watching the thing on boxing and you could see that the movements that they do, first they have to understand they're going to practice and drill and drill and drill until when that person throws that hook, they know to move because it's a hook and not something else. If you move at the wrong time with the wrong response, you can put yourself into danger instead of out of danger. Karate and the other arts are no different to that same idea. The more you train, the more you come to understand how someone's moving, what they're trying to do or about to do, where you're vulnerable, and what you need to do to protect that, and then combining that with your my, what kind of movement is going to put you in a better place, or allow you to do the technique or thing that you think is necessary in that moment. I say that intentionally because it's not predetermined, right? I can't just go, I'm going to do this, this, and this to this person. Because every part of our interaction changes. Enter that whole Jurassic Park chaos theory that Jeff Goldblum's character Ian Malcolm puts together, right? This idea that every time an interaction takes place, something different happens. Fighting is no different. Every part of that is going to be different and change. As you affect the other person, they affect you. And this continues in this constant ongoing back and forth. So you can't just assume what's going to happen. We don't have this Sherlock Holmes, this is how the entire fight's going to play out kind of thing. I've never seen anybody actually do that. As cool as that would be, I would love to study that thing, but I don't think it exists. There's too much chaos. So you have to make sure that you're including the idea that this stuff is determined in the moment based on all sorts of things, both conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. All of that comes together and becomes your decision-making process, that OODA loop that you follow, and they have one too. So you've got to make sure to practice that, and Kumite is where that comes from. And then lastly, to develop Kiai and stamina, which cannot be fully attained through the practice of Kata alone. Yeah, without interacting with another person, there's a level of stress that doesn't exist. You can induce a lot through the power of your mind. It's an incredible tool. But until you start working with a person who's going to push you in ways that, that doesn't happen, your ability to, to maximize what you're capable of and to sustain that through the course of stamina is not possible without pressure testing with someone else. It's just not there. So you got to have it. Enter Kumite. You know, fourthly, he says, fully utilize such methods as rope skipping, exercise with barbells, dumbbells, etc. to develop the muscles and physical power. So there it is, folks. You need to have supplemental training. You need to be doing something, either bodyweight exercises or hitting the gym, doing things that are going to allow for supplemental training to improve what you have. The old masters did it. We should be doing it too. Make sure that you look at how that goes together. If you have the option of working with somebody who has both physical conditioning knowledge, you know, someone who's personal trainer, thing like that, and also martial knowledge, they're going to help guide you towards the right things to do to build the proper types of strength, etc., that you need for your martial art. You're also going to find it in your training. There's a lot of solo drills and things that can develop that from a bodyweight perspective. 
So make sure you look for that kind of stuff. If you don't have that, general basic conditioning is going to help you no matter what. Your cardiovascular system and your overall strength and agility, all of that stuff really is always going to build towards a more successful fighter, period. Okay, number five, study the use of the Makiwara from every possible position to develop a temi or concentrated striking power. If you don't have a Makiwara any, anymore these days, you could build one pretty easily. There are so many resources now on how to build one or different versions of them, but also the heavy bag and different types of things allow for, for impact training, the ability to focus power and develop that explosive strength. It's an important part with karate being percussive as one of its primary methodologies. The ability to strike accurately and well with a lot of power is really important. So they would use the makiwara to train that impact and that response. They could hit that harder than they would ever hit their training partner so that they could continue to develop that. So that when they did hit somebody, be it their training partner or somebody else in a self-defense situation or a fight or whatever not all of them were, were good people that only practice this stuff in good situations so keep that in mind when they did that they had destructive power that was developed somehow and not all of it could be developed on each other so back to tools and supplemental training the makiwara that's what it was for having something that allows you to do that having a makiwara having a heavy bag having people holding pads things like that that allow you to explosively execute strikes is hugely important. You can't ignore it. It's got to be part of your training. And the last, probably the most controversial of what he recommends here, uh, but not a far stretch for a lot of people, is including Zazen or sitting Zen meditation and concentration as part of your training. Uh, I do believe that it's useful. It does not have to be spiritual or religiously based. Right? Just the act of sitting and focusing and concentrating and clearing your mind and actively allowing yourself to think and focus without being distracted by things. Now more than ever, thanks to technology and social media where everything is in 5 second, 10 second, 30 second bursts, we need it. We need something that's practicing the idea of extended concentration. You gotta have it. So sitting and concentrating specifically for the purpose of developing that skill is useful. I believe it should be included. You can decide differently based off of your background and, and how well you're able to separate the idea of the word Zen being a religious thing. Some people really struggle with that. I encourage you not to. That the practice is not the practice does not have to be something that has a spiritual connotation applied to it. So just keep that in mind. Just focus on the idea of having focus being able to focus, being able to dial in on a thing and subtract things around you, not be distracted, that's huge. Make sure you're doing it. I believe it's important. So that's it today. What do you think of, of Shoshi Nagamine's ideas on study of martial arts and karate? Do you think that he's on the right track? Do you, do you incorporate these kind of things into your training? Do you think that there's things that he missed or, or should not have included? Drop them in the comments. Let's talk about it. Otherwise, thank you for hanging on this long. I'm going to throw up some links. So you've got a place to subscribe over here. You've got the ability to check out the playlist of these types of videos, these book kind of things that I'm doing. And here and here, a couple other videos that you might like. That's it today. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. Keep training. Train hard. And I'll catch you in the next one.